And with that, I am going to uh, turn things over to Charlie. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm a little clunky still on Zoom. So uh, um, let me just go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Looks beautiful. We okay, can everybody see that? Okay, great. Um, so I am going to be spending some time talking today um, about something that Ginny and Rachel and I have talked about um, that people might want to hear about, know more about. Um, so I'm going to talk about my experiences as a um, MLIS student and also a um, graduate student worker um, through this ROI internship and then also the practicum that I've been doing with Rachel. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about my experiences as a person through all of this because that um, matters as well. So um, to start out, I thought I'd introduce myself. Ginny introduced me a little bit, but I thought I would introduce myself a little bit more. Um, my name's Charlie. My pronouns are they, them. I am an MLIS student. I should be graduating this spring um, unless all of my anxiety-fueled stress dreams come true, and I don't do that, um, but should be graduating this spring. I also am an ROI intern. I've been one since I started my MLIS program um, in fall of 2019, um, and then I'm also a practicum student. Um, I'm doing my capstone practicum with Rachel Olson. Um, I've been working with assessment for the CST 105 classes, doing some roundtable discussions, as well as some various other tasks that have popped up, um, such as working on accessibility and uh, some tutorials. Um, I also always like to mention the social work aspect because that's something that um, I carry with me into library and information science still. Um, I got my BSW from UNCG, and then I worked as a social worker for um, a bit and actually was getting my MSW before I realized I hate this and I'm miserable and I um, actually had a big like come to Jesus talk with my mom and I was like I don't know what I want to do and um, we kind of compiled all of my interests and um, she pointed me towards library science and I've never looked back since but the um, a lot of the values and a lot of what I was trained in um, as a social worker have really been deeply instilled and are important to me as a librarian moving forward. A big part of that is you can't um, separate parts of people from themselves, if that makes sense, like people are whole. Um, and that is especially important to me as someone who is queer and disabled. Those come into play with how I move through the world, um, including professionally move through the world. And those have definitely impacted, um, you know, what's been going on since the pandemic started. So I always like to talk a little about the social work um, part. That's always very important to me. Um, and, you know, the way I move through everything as a queer and disabled person with like social work values, um, it gives me a unique perspective and um, has helped really shape um, a lot of my study. So um, I have a very short attention span. So I like to break things up as best as I can. So I'm gonna break things up into four parts. I'm gonna talk a little bit about pre-pandemic, what that looked like, just so I can establish um, like just a standard that can be used for comparison. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the first couple of months through the summer, such as being furloughed, living alone um, and all of that uncertainty. And then coming back um, both to the ROI internship and also back to school and the challenges I faced and continue to face in that type of arena. And then I wanna spend some time talking about like the support I've um, received from a variety of different um, groups and people and what has been helpful to me in that, uh, in that way. So pre-pandemic, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the internship, school, and then my home life. Um, so I've kind of, at this point, up until recently, I think, I had always kind of compartmentalized everything into three parts. So I had school, um, I was, I'm a full-time MLIS student. I started in the fall of 2019. Like I said, I was a previous social worker and I had a little bit of personal difficulty 
you know, switching from social work to library science um, because I just had that social work mindset. It's all going to go up in flames. And I remember being told one of my first times at the reference desk by actually Rachel that um, there's no such thing as library emergency. So I had to do like quite a bit of a like shift in thinking and like framework and how I thought of my job and profession. Um, and that was kind of challenging, but I don't know. So anyway, yeah. And then my work. So when I started my MLIS program, I also started um, the ROI internship program. And this involved um, a lot of in-person shifts at the reference desk and how the reference desk is set up. There's like two seats, two seating areas. And generally there was another intern with me or another like librarian who sat um, and was there. And we kind of served as like the you know, customer facing, whatever, uh, front facing role to answer any questions of any university community members or any community members in general who came in and had any questions, um, we were there to help uh, point them in the right direction or answer them. And then also we were trained in chat. Um, I, I don't think that I answered the same number of chats that I did at this point than I did, than I have been doing recently, but we still had, I still had some of that experience. And of course we did other things. We had professional development workshops. We did mini instruction sessions. You know, we worked on other things, but these were the two things that really stood out. And I think I'm, I'm using for comparison later on to look at like before and after. Um, personal, I just said, I was just doing my best. I was like a regular graduate student. I was stressed about, you know, assignments and work and, you know, like doing it all because it's just a lot. Um, and then I'm pet parent and friend and family member. Those are really important things to me. I spend a lot of time cultivating relationships with friends and family. And then I like to disclose this because it's just something that does impact me. Um, and I'll talk about my mental health in a little bit, but I'm bipolar and I have um, auditory processing disorder. And that impacts like a lot of different areas of my life, um, especially during a pandemic. So that's just a little bit about what it was like pre-pandemic, I had my school, I had my work and internship, and then I had just me living my life as best as I could in a stressed world. Um, so then it all started. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about being furloughed, living alone, and then dealing with the uncertainty. So I made this little chart thing because I like little chart graph things. So in March, it all, you know, my mom in particular had been talking to me about everything that was going on. And I had heard, overheard some other conversations about things starting to, you know, get to a point where a quarantine was going to happen. But at that point, I, along with a lot of other people, I wasn't, you know, taking it like it was going to be an extensive thing. Um, but in mid-March, I checked my email about two hours before a shift that I had and got an email from um, the department saying, hey, don't come in. No one's coming in anymore. We don't know how long. Um, we'll, we just no one knows anything pretty much. It's all kind of up in the air, or at least that's what was disclosed to me. So at that point, I was like, okay, it's just going to be two weeks of me not working, two weeks of me, you know, just isolating by myself. Um, and I felt a lot of uncertainty in that, but it didn't feel permanent. It felt kind of like, oh, this will pass. I, this might be kind of a scary thing that's happening right now, but it's not going to affect me long term. But then it moved into April and um, I pretty much, you know, it was confirmed that, you know, there weren't any plans to come back for a while. Um, and I ended up just having a really hard time with that because I felt, you know, scared about, you know, my future. Um, I was nervous I wasn't going to have enough experience when I graduated. I was nervous about, well, you know, like, am I going to, you know, be able to work in the summer? What about in the next academic year? Like, I really depend on the income I, I get from this internship to like pay my groceries, like pay for groceries and gas in my car. And so there was some strain that started to happen. And then it kind of got to a point where I was just, you know, stressed all the time and hadn't seen another person in a long time and was, you know, having all these issues. So 
I ended up, you know, taking an incomplete in one of my classes and feeling like I, everything just dropped out from under me. Um, and it started, the uncertainty started to feel really heavy on me. I felt it like all the time, like there was something on my chest and, um, it was pretty intense to kind of process all of that. Um, but, um, so then in the, in July, I actually missed an email and I only saw this email after I had gotten another email saying, Hey, did you see this email from the department, uh, the ROI department asking me if I would be interested in coming back and doing chat shifts like re remotely, virtually. Um, and at that point I had just, you know, thought through, okay, how am I going to, you know, pay some of my bills? How am I going to get experience? I had, you know, just already kind of like assumed that things weren't going to come together, but they did. And that was the quickest yes I've said uh, in a very long time. So I said, yes, I would like to come back and do this. And um, I spent a while then because I had gotten to a point where my brain was in kind of survival mode and I needed to spend a lot of time reviewing to get up to date with new policies. I needed to just go back over everything. Um, and I needed to kind of like prepare to like jump right back into answering questions because I knew that it was important for me to come and generally know either what I was talking about or where to find it easily. Um, and then I also started preparing for school. I had a lot of anxiety around that because I wasn't sure what classes were going to look like. I wasn't sure what, you know, like the assignments are going to look like um, because even the spring semester, you know, when the pandemic first started, very quickly, a lot of my classes restructured and um, to accommodate, like not being able to go observe uh, a live instruction, you couldn't do that anymore. So you had to, you know, watch these videos instead, or um, like this assignment got absorbed into this assignment. So I was nervous about what that was going to look like, um, what it was going to look like to be a full-time student again, um, and what it was going to look like uh, doing this work remotely via chat. So let's see. So then it really started. Um, so I'm going to talk about coming back, the difficult adjustments, and then the mental health challenges I experienced. Um, so coming back and adapting was a bit of a, a bit, a bit jarring almost. Um, transitioning from in-person to virtual was unique as a student worker. When I say unique, I mean that I felt and I continue to feel in kind of a, a limbo almost, um, which isn't necessarily a negative thing. Um, I say that because I feel very um, insulated and protected by my department because I'm an intern. I'm not a full, you know, full employee. So I'm not subject to like some discussions. I don't have to sit in on meetings. I might not know what's going on behind the scenes necessarily as much as someone else might. And I liked that a lot of times because I had so much on my plate and I like wasn't necessarily like emotionally prepared to handle like tough conversations that I know a lot of people were having or having to like engage with that. So in some ways I kind of had that like really nice buffer between like me and then the actual like office politics work discussions that were happening. Um, and that was nice, but it also meant I did feel a little in the dark sometimes. Um, but thankfully I have great leadership and I was able to just trust and go along with that. But it definitely was something that was really heightened or and like highlighted during um, this like big transition. Uh, shifting communication styles were challenging. And I mean this more in like a personal way. <laughs> um, I have always been somewhat of a nervous person, but I became very anxious during, you know, the pandemic, I would say. And I had a lot of challenges learning how to communicate effectively over email, over chat, you know, waiting to, um, waiting to schedule a meeting with someone. And that's all on me, you know, because I was used to being able to turn around and say, Hey, can I have help with this? And someone would answer it. I, you know, spent a lot of time, like 
stress that my emails had too many exclamation marks or not enough or like was this tone bad like I even installed something uh, like a plugin that would like help us read your tone to see if your tone was bad because I was constant you know constantly stressed that I was going to come across as like rude or whatever um so that was just something I had to learn how to get over um, and then personally asserting needs and concerns became more difficult from my, from my end because I felt bad asking people and like I was bothering people because I knew that everyone had so much going on like on their on their plate um and I was if I needed something I I did ask but I felt bad about it and everyone was always so kind and willing to help it's it's really just like my anxieties as a student worker <laughs> coming out in these ways um so those are some of like the challenges that I noticed um personally pretty early on um but my experiences as a remote student worker so I I talked a bit about the unique challenges and that um you know I was insulated in a way um which was definitely helpful a lot of times um also the lag in communication was it was different it just meant I had to get adjusted to responding through email um because like I said I had you know, been trained and had had a lot of experience uh, as an RO intern where I would, if I had a question, be able to immediately find someone. Um, so I had to learn how to like communicate via email, which is what everybody else does. Um, I just had never had like a lot of professional experience with that. So that was something that I had to learn about. Um, I also experienced some isolation in some sense. Um, and I felt some loss of socialization because my, um, the internship, there were other graduate students who were also interns along with me. And I felt like some camaraderie in that. So I didn't have to stress about comparing myself to people who are way more like experienced and, um, you know, have a degree actually. There was something like comforting about being able to talk and have trainings with people who, um, were at the same level I was at and I did miss that. But I will say like, you know, the independence that I have gained as a remote student worker is just um, incredible. Um, it was very challenging in the beginning to not have someone beside me, but I've developed a lot more confidence. Um, I feel like I am able to ask questions, you know, easier. Um, and I just feel like I've, I've grown a lot more and the flexible structure that working remotely as a student worker, um, that, that structure that has been afforded to me has been really helpful, um, particularly if I'm having like a not great day, because before I would have to, you know, like put on pants and go and interact with someone. Um, but now I'm able to still stay in a controlled environment in my house and um, still respond to people on chat and be active on chat. But, uh, you know, during days where it's a little harder, that like more flexible structure, like really is very, uh, it has a lot of benefits to it. Let's see. Okay. So my experiences as a student have really varied and there's pretty much a pro and con to um, each of these. So there have been, really flexible deadlines and more options to work at a different pace um and this just means that you know instructors and professors recognized that um people were going through a lot so i've had several professors that have been like just turn everything in by the end of the semester and that's nice um and it's afforded me like some relief but it also is challenging for someone who like works best under pressure, which is like a nice way of saying procrastinate sometimes. Um, and then there's been a huge shift, at least that I've noticed in class assignments and requirements. Um, I've mentioned that one of my classes had like a requirement for an in-person, you know, uh, you had to like watch someone teach in person and then report on it. That couldn't happen anymore. So that class assignment got changed. And then another class had you're supposed to interview someone in person and that couldn't happen anymore. So you could do it via email. And like, so then the questions were different and things have just shifted to, um, you know, kind of like accommodate everything that's going on. 
And overall, I would say there's been less structure. I, you know, that's shown, I think, in like the flexible deadlines and more options to work at a different pace. Um, and that less structure has meant that there is some grace in uh, completing assignments. Um, but it also feels sometimes like I get a little sad thinking, am I getting the traditional experience because I, you know, it, it, this is a different format than it would have been last year. In my first year, I remember doing things a little more, uh, like typically. And so it's felt a little like, oh, I'm so glad this is happening. I have, you know, opportunity to kind of like take care of myself as well as school, um, but it also just means I feel a little, um, I feel, I'm just curious if this means I've like missed out on, um, a, like a traditional like, graduate student experience. So my experiences as a practicum student, I've had just such incredible independence, um, which was very challenging for me at first as a person, because like I said, I'm, I've gotten to be more anxious and I was constantly questioning myself, but I feel like I've really grown and the independence that I have gained as a remote practicum student, I think will be very useful um, in future jobs. Um, there's been a lot of flexibility and understanding that's been built into this practicum experience. Um, Rachel and I had a meeting, I think our first meeting, I had said something like, sometimes I don't I, I only can work until 2 a.m. Is that okay? And um, which is what it probably wouldn't be normally, but right now that's what I could do. And, it, you know, as long as we establish that as long as the tasks get done, then that's fine. Um, I also had a lot of freedom to explore my interests. I wasn't necessarily expecting this as much, to be honest, um, but I've been able to talk with Rachel and Sam um, about some things I'm interested in and I've been able to look into them more and explore them and kind of like uh, play around a little bit with them. And that's been something that has been just really helpful um, and useful in uh, my professional life. The lag in communication has come up again. And that's, I'm not saying that like it's anyone's, anyone's responding slowly. I'm just saying my anxiety has had to like reset about what communication is like now, because before, you know, I would maybe be able to immediately find someone to ask a question, but I can't do that anymore. Um, and I had that experience in social work too. I, there was always a supervisor in an office right off of where I was working. So I could go in and say, Hey, I need help with this. So learning kind of how to communicate um, again was challenging, especially because I am pretty hard on myself and would want to make sure everything that I was doing was okay. And I, it's just was, I'm sure it was a lot to reach for Rachel to handle. Um, I've also really, as a practicum student, experienced a lot of stress and anxiety about my professional performance. I'm really worried all the time. Am I doing enough? Am I, you know, causing you know, too much, like, uh, am I confusing people? Am I making this harder for people? Am I being a burden? Um, just kind of all of those things are, have come out a lot for me personally um, in this practicum because I am, you know, I've been given a lot of opportunity to explore what I'm interested in and also have been given a lot of responsibility that I'm thankful to have, but it's just made me uh, be very hard on myself. Um, and then a little bit about like myself as a person. And I think in the conversations I've had with other graduate students, I think this is very much what a lot of other people have experienced. So my anxiety skyrocketed. I was always worried. How's my tone? I would have dreams about getting fired. Uh, I like dreams. I, I mentioned about, you know, not, um, getting to graduate, like that was another thing that came up. How am I gonna pay rent? Um, I, along with so many other student workers, like really depend on that income to kind of supplement, you know, grants and loans and things like that. So, you know, I budget very carefully, but I was worried, what if all of a sudden, like this can't be a thing anymore, what am I gonna do then? Um, how am I gonna get a job after graduation? I 
spend a lot of time looking for jobs still and it's now and it's still very it's tough out there um and so i'm i'm like as a person with not as much experience how am i going to get a job um i question who would ever hire me and then also how many plants is too many plants i got a lot of plants at the start of pandemic and it became a really <laughs> excessive coping mechanism um i have experienced a lot of like long-term isolation which is probably like impacted me more than I, um, it's probably impacted me more than I can imagine. Um, I, there was a point where I didn't leave my house except to walk my dog around the block for weeks. Um, and since I live alone, this is my first time living alone. Um, and I went a long time without seeing someone. And there was a point when I didn't remember the last time I had been hugged which was a very sobering, sad statement or a thing to think about. I didn't remember the last time someone had like touched me um, because I wanted to keep my friends, my family, my community safe. And that meant, you know, sheltering in place or the terminology that's correct for this state. But um, it just meant that I was stressed about school all the time and what was happening. And then I was living alone and I just stared at my dog in the wall all the time. Um, another big challenge I had, I live in a 550 square foot apartment, which I, I love my apartment, but that just means I, as someone who has a really difficult time structuring my day on my own, um, I was just staying in my bed all day and I would just move from one part to the next, you know, to do homework and then log on to chat and then to relax um, and it was really affecting my mental health because I was having a hard time saying, okay, well, get up and go into your living room. Um, before all of this, I had mentioned that I had broken my life into three parts and that involved me actually going somewhere and doing something. I would, you know, go to the library to do a chat or a in-person shift and then to do schoolwork, I would go to a coffee shop. I would go back to the library. I'd go to a friend's house. Um, or any of the combination. And then I would come back to my house and relax and hang out. But I didn't have that anymore. Um, all of a sudden, I just had to exist within 550 square feet without leaving. And that was really challenging and probably negatively impacted my mental health more than I can really say. I also had issues with school. Um, I mean, I, you know, thankfully I like finished my incomplete and everything's been fine, but I, you know, always was questioning how am I supposed to do this when I'm so stressed, my hair is falling out and I'm having stress dreams. And I like, you know, don't really have anyone I feel super comfortable talking to. How am I supposed to graduate? Like, am I going to graduate? Um, and it was, it was very challenging to kind of navigate all of that. And the last part that was challenging was getting support. Um, I felt a lot of guilt about asking for support in general, because I knew everyone else is struggling. So why should I ask for help when everyone else is struggling? And that just makes it harder on everyone else. And, you know, the question of how, do, how am I going to stay healthy as someone who is bipolar? Um, you know, especially when I was having problems self-regulating and sticking to, you know, somewhat of a normal schedule and not just staying in bed all day. Um, which bipolar disorder and a lot of other mental health, you know, things require a lot of structure. And I just didn't have that, like, I didn't have that automatically built into my schedule anymore. Um, and I actually had a pretty bad episode over winter break because I had from March until, you know, mid-December just pushed everything down because I just, there was too much going on and I couldn't deal with it. And then I like, you know, my brain like freaked out at that point because I was like, I can't keep pushing it down. I have to, you know, address it. And it came out and it was, you know, pretty rough. My mom had to come stay with me, which um, someone at my age, having your mom come take care of you was definitely like a little sobering, but um, you know, it was very challenging to kind of, uh, ask for support, get support, especially when, you know, I'm in the middle of a mental health crisis. Um, like, how do I navigate that when 
you know, besides my mom coming, I'm still, I'm my, all of the support systems I have in place are still virtual. I'm not actually seeing anyone. I'm still just in my house. So there was just a lot of components to how do I stay healthy and how do I like get through it when I am having um, a crisis. And um, so let's see. So then I, I feel like I said things that were hard, but I, I don't want it to sound like I didn't have a lot of wonderful things that happened because I feel very fortunate to have had a lot of the experiences I did. I think this pandemic was tough on everyone. I think it's been particularly tough on students and student workers. Um, and I feel very thankful to still have had the support I did have. So some easy, helpful things were first off the graduate school, I ended up getting a micro grant, um, which was just um, amazing. My computer decided to die in January. I thought it was gonna make it until I graduated, but it decided it did not want to do that. So um, thankfully I had a Mac micro grant come through from the graduate school, which meant that there was some financial stress that kind of went away. Um, there were also transcript changes that happened. Um, so now the semesters where, you know, there was a significant impact, it says on the transcript, like these classes were taken during the pandemic or during a global health crisis, I think is what it says. And that um, gave me some comfort to know that, you know, the school is like recognizing that this was challenging for everyone. And then also like pass fail options. I didn't end up doing pass fail um, because I felt fine not doing it, but it was nice again to have like the graduate school build in like some safety nets for students who might be struggling. Um, Cause that brought me a lot of comfort. Um, the library staff in general, my, the ROI department who I have the most experience with, but I've interacted with other departments and they've also been this way have always been very willing to help and like not judgmental towards me asking a question because like I said, I get very nervous um, asking questions because I feel like I'm gonna bother someone or it's you know, a dumb question or whatnot. But the, the department staff that I have had interactions with have continued to be very kind and willing and that just makes me feel like it's a safe environment. Um, I don't necessarily have a like tangible way to describe this, but I always felt like the ROI department was very affirming and welcoming and kind and supportive. And that's still translated virtually, which I wasn't expecting it to, but I still feel that. I still feel like even though it's virtual, it's still like a safe environment for me um, where I have the support I need. The supervision I've received from um, both my um, internship supervisors and my practicum supervisor have been like just completely necessary and so important. There's been a lot of openness and flexibility and like an expectation to openness, not in a not in a negative way, but um, I feel always like I can talk to either of them and say, hey, I'm struggling with something and it, I never feel like it's an issue. Um, and I feel like it's always taken seriously so that like openness like feels very healthy and I have always appreciated that. Um, also, both of my supervisors have really like pushed for professional development. I'm not great at doing it because I'm, I, I just have so much on my plate and I'm tired, but I <laughs> like, which is probably not great, but um, there's been a, a big effort. I feel like on my like the staff's supervision, like my supervisors have to um, really help me out and like get me set up to like be in good standing when I graduate. Um, and I also feel like my supervisors and all of the library staff and, you know, and so forth, but my supervisors have been very invested in me as a person. Um, like I mentioned before, I don't, think that like people are just a part of themselves at work. I think you show up to work as a whole person and that like can impact how you move through everything. And I feel like both of my supervisors have really um, invested in me in a person and have really like given me the opportunity to be happy and healthy and be like the best student worker, intern, practicum student I could be. And I'm very thankful for that. 
on top of that, um, my family and friends have been really important. Um, and I've had opportunities to really like cultivate those relationships more than I expected. Um, so I've had a lot of virtual get togethers. Um, I do zoom working sessions with several people, including my brother, who's an undergraduate student. Um, and we'll just be on zoom and like doing work and ask, um, for help when we need it, but that like provides that like accountability that like I used to have with in-person study sessions that I don't have anymore. Um, I feel like in general, people have been checking in on each other more. Um, and this also goes for like my experiences as a practicum student ROI intern as well, but check-ins are always really helpful um, and kind of, uh, establish like that level of like care and compassion that feels necessary at this time. Um, and then also my pets and my plants have been really what's gotten me through it a lot. My dog and my cat are my buddies. Um, and then my too many plants. Um, we all live in too small a space together probably. Um, but so those are some like, I, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I just kind of wanted to talk, you know, about the support I've received and um, how that's really helped me get through it. Because I think without all of these things, I would not be where I am. Um, so yeah. Um, and then this is this next is this is a quote from my mom. I showed this to her, this presentation to her, and she said this, and it really stuck out to me. The little things are the big things. Um, she's also a public librarian um, who works for a more rural area and has been doing a lot of really intense things to support community members during um, COVID. But she always says little things are the big things. And um, I think that's very true. You know, the little things that have happened to me, you know, like someone checking in or, you know, like whatever comes up um, related to the ROI internship, that's just something small, really makes a big impact on me because I might not be able to digest the big things and we might not get as many big things that are um, that are going on. Um, but this is something she always says. She also always says, um, if I'm feeling cranky or I have a headache, she's always like, eat some fruit, drink some water and go take a walk. So these two things I always keep in my, uh, my head when I am um, just having a not great time. So I know I kind of talked for a little bit. Um, I kind of wanted to open it up to see if anyone had any questions about anything. I haven't been keeping up with the chat because I've been talking uh, and I can't multitask. But um, I, um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Charlie. This was amazing. Um, uh, you're, I, I haven't seen much in the way of questions in the chat, but a lot of people, um, expressing how your, um, the way you described your experiences was very resonant for them. Um, so lots of uh, basically plus ones there in the chat. Um, do folks have questions? Uh, this is sort of a question maybe from Steve. Um, yes, flexibility plus structure seems to be the best practice, but harder to implement than it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. <laughs> and I think the way that it's been really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Effective for me is I've just had a lot of communication with the people who are trying to like be really flexible and like, you know, create that like structure that's helpful. Like there's just always been like a really open line of communication between myself and pretty much anyone who is supervising me or helping me or whatever. Um, those. So if you're, I don't know if you can see the chat, but um, we have uh, a comment. I don't have a question. Just want to say this really resonates with me. The email communication and being paranoid about tone, along with worrying I'm not doing enough, even though I know I'm working all the time, et cetera, and also adjusting to how other folks have changed during this. Um, I think that's a really interesting, interesting point there at the end, thinking about not only adjusting our own communication styles because things are different, but also like adjusting our own communication and interpersonal styles based on 
how things are changing for other people. So just like sort of constant adjustment and uh, thinking a lot about how we are communicating, especially written communication, right? It, like, like Charlie has said a number of times, somehow it just feels more like the stakes feel higher right now because you're that's like kind of all you're able to do a lot of times is, is engage in written communication with folks. Any um, other questions or, or comments for Charlie? I have a comment and a question. Um, first off, the comment. Um, this is one of the best presentations I've been to the whole pandemic. I just really appreciate your openness and like how you explained it. It was just really good. I was like eating my lunch and like, oh, I love this so much. So thank you so much for being, you know, honest and open. And I feel like it's a really good lesson for like anyone who supervises anyone to hear about your experiences. And I actually think, you know, if you felt open, this could be a great presentation anywhere. You know, I think again, it was just really useful and a great learning experience. My question is that you're in this very unique situation of having worked here, um, in person, you know, going in, <laughs> I mean, we're always in person, um, and, you know, having, like you said in here, a, a cohort of grad students, and then you started working completely virtual in a solo experience, and of course, as you probably know, we're going to be re-looking at how we do internships moving forward based on a lot of things, um, and what do you think has worked well, you know, in terms of the virtual, and what do you miss most about going in? You kind of touched upon that, but again, um, when we think through how we're going to be doing internships and practicums moving forward, we really, I mean, I can speak for me, I really want to stick with the flexibility, I want to stick with the, like, you know, um, kind of being more open to like life things happening, but then at the same time, like we're probably gonna have more people, right? Like there are hours that need to be filled. So what do you think we could do better moving forward? Or even if you don't wanna like call out specific things, like what have you liked the most about what's happened so far? Yeah, um, so I think the thing I miss the most about in-person is really, this sounds probably not great, but like the couple minutes before each training session we had every week where the other interns and I could talk about something or like have you know like space like an informal type space to like talk about you know like sometimes someone would ask a question or like we would talk about things we've noticed that have come up and that was always really helpful to have that like sort of um like self-teaching that's not the right word but um to have those like moments where like people who were going through a similar thing is like we could communicate and like um, peer teaching. Yeah, um, that was always some, that's something that I've definitely missed. I think I have really enjoyed getting so much practice um, on like chat because I think that's how it's gonna be in most things moving forward. So I'm, I'm thankful that I feel a lot more comfortable in it. Um, and I think like having all that experience um, uh, I think having all that experience like with chat has been incredibly useful. Um, but yeah, I do, I do miss those like little bits of time where, um, we could talk about some stuff just because it's, it's just harder for me to like feel comfortable doing that with, and I don't really have the space to, you know, be like, Hey Sam, what's up? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, it was just nice to talk to other graduate students. So I, I don't know if like, I know, water cooler things happen um so I wonder if that could be a thing for like interns moving forward who like do only remote stuff like there could still be some sort of talking thing or that was just very helpful to me because I feel like I gained so many skills practice like doing things um virtually and in person but I miss that like moment those moments does that answer the question yes thank okay. you sorry ramble <laughs> And Amy has her hand up. Amy? Sorry, I'm on chat. <laughs> so just, I'm multitasking, not very well. So I, I mean, I don't actually, uh, this is more of a comment than a question. I just wanted to tell you that I absolutely love your presentation style. And like, I, I just, I, I, but I feel like you, you know, you have that. And I don't know if it's your background or just like you. 
but like you have such a calming aura about you and I, you know that was true at the desk I think when we were doing that um but I just want to say that I think you're an awesome presenter and um that you should you should do more of it because you're really good at it thank you I, that means a lot I feel like I'm I I sit here and I'm like Ooh, like no, <laughs> no, no you, you do do. amazing so <laughs> I just you. wanted to say that I don't have <laughs> So nice. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, this, I mean, this was truly an excellent um, presentation. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I, and, and like other people have said, it's just kind of nice. And this is what I was hoping would come out of this, right? This just kind of nice to hear that other people are dealing with some of the things that you are that you wouldn't necessarily talk, like talk about. Like I haven't really talked to anybody specifically about like, anxiety over email tone, but it sounds like a lot of people are having that, you know, we're talking about sort of bigger, bigger anxieties or things that feel bigger, or, um, more universal or whatever, but there are all these things happening that we are, um, it, that we're all kind of dealing with that we haven't necessarily talked about. So I, I really appreciate having this space. Um, and it sounds like several other folks here also appreciate that. Little things are the big things. I think yes. I'll take that away. My mom, she she's known for having like a little phrase that you're like, oh, like <laughs> yeah. Every every conversation that you and I have ever had that deals with um with your mom um just makes me think that your mom must be an incredible human. Yeah, so. she's pretty cool. She's a public librarian. So uh, yeah. I'm actually um because I am fully vaccinated now, I'm going home this weekend and Yay. I'm gonna get to hug my grandparents for the first time in like a year and a half. So, um, awesome. and my mom will be there too. But uh, uh, yeah, so I'm about to go see her and I will let her know that people think she's cool. <laughs> She'll like that. She's great. Okay. Yeah, Any other questions or comments for Charlie? I was gonna say, I know it's been difficult. It's been, you know, a really long road, a really tough road, but I think that I just have seen a lot of growth from you um, in really positive ways. And I feel really good about your ability when you, um, when you get into, you know, library work after graduation, I feel like you'll be a really, um, you know, you're positioning yourself really well for success in this field. Um, and a lot of emotional intelligence. Um, you have a lot of emotional intelligence that I think the rest of us um, kind of wish we had. So really great Thank job you. there. That's yeah. so nice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you've come, a, you've come a really long way and I think you have a ton to be proud of. So great job. I appreciate it. I mean, I really feel like this whole, both practicum and ROI internship has like really been, it's been like invaluable, like. So I appreciate all of y'all <laughs> so much. Well, and you have helped us out a lot in ROI um, as well. And so thank you for all that you yes. do. Yes, you're amazing. Thank you. You've been steady as a rock when we really needed you. So thank you. Yeah. Just had like a Charlie love fest for- Yes, absolutely. Like, I, I'm totally up for that. I just wanna, I just wanna- Wow, and it's, is it still being- no, it is still being recorded. So I get to go that. look at this later. That's right. Look later, Please play yeah. this later. <laughs> just, just remember how amazing you are. <laughs> we all, we all think that you're amazing. So. Oh, I appreciate that. But like, yeah, Charlie's graded close to like 400 CST 105 thingies this semester, and y'all know what a struggle bus that was for me alone last semester. So having some, <laughs> having help, uh, is just really like, you you've done a ton of work. I mean, we've talked about pulling your weight and you've pulled your weight and then some, and like in many ways. I, I really, I know I talked to you about it, but I've really enjoyed doing those CST things, which is probably a crazy thing to say, but uh, I, there's just something nice about just sitting there and like, you know, I don't know. Grading is, um, grading, what a wild ride grading can be, but it can also yeah. be nice yeah, to just have something kind of simple to take your mind off things. Yeah. I enjoyed it, honestly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I see folks are heading out, and I know we are getting close to lunchtime, um, at least for me. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the recording, but I want to thank Charlie one more time. This was fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah.
really just lots, lots of good stuff to think about too. So thank you for sharing and um, virtual applause, clap, claps around, around <laughs> applause. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone has a great day. And again, thank you particularly to Charlie. Yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate yeah. it. Oh yeah, it was great. All right. All right. I'm going to close it out and the recording will stop. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Charlie.